have a lecture on the Maybe you should reconsider that.
did it have an internal logic that led from one commitment to the next? Or were those shifts historically determined by forces outside him? So these kinds of things, because artists can be led by a kind of internal thought process, which might not have much to do with what's happening outside, or he might have I mean, historical forces I mean, compelling him to respond to these things. These are some of the things that we can do. Now, to a certain extent, these kind of changes of focus or direction is a fairly common feature in artist careers. And even if, I mean, the thematic focus remains the same, there will be various other changes that come. And some of them might be related to executional elements, qualities that change. Or an artist might be changing his conceptual framework as he moves along. Now, these are factors that I mean, art historians look at, try to study, try to I mean, describe them as elements that contribute to the evolution of a particular artist himself. Now, anyone looking at young people will realize that in this case, that at any given point of time, there are, I mean, multiple aspects with which he is preoccupied with. Now, it is, and also often, there are multiple styles or ways of rendering that he is preoccupied with. So these are general kind of things that, I mean, are important to anyone looking at Ram. Now, because one of the reasons why this should happen in art is that, I mean, at any given point of time when you look at the world, unless you are yourself very restricted, you might see the world as multidimensional, offering you multiple choices, and we are the ones who are choosing one of those possibilities. Now, sometimes these possibilities are based on certain historical moments, and sometimes those possibilities that you choose from might be determined by very personal things like the skill that one has. Because there might be things that you'd like to address, but I mean, an artist might not find language in which he wants to address it. Like we can see, I mean, uh, you could say someone like Nathaniel up towards the end of his career, he wanted to do a certain kind of painting, a certain kind of art to which he didn't find the appropriate language. I mean, at the same time, we can see that he finds the appropriate way of addressing those in his writings. But as a painter, he doesn't just paint to find it. So these things can also be elements, although, I mean, from the critical point of view, we might sometimes consider these as less important aspects, but for a person trying to be voice to his concerns, this can be a fairly um, important thing. Now, even when we make these choices, we can make unilateral choices. I mean, we can decide, okay, I am going to be on this side, now, in many cases, Ram Kingo in the thirties that he found it difficult to make such unilateral judgments or make choices. Sometimes he would prefer to hold the two things in the opposing elements in a kind of tension and reflect upon the dynamics rather than the resolution. Now, that is probably one of the, I mean, elements that, I mean, uh, makes him a slightly different kind of artist as well. Now, with these, I will try to kind of look at Ram Pinker in the context of Shandini. Of course, one of the common kind of uh, perceptions that come when you talk about him in the context of I mean, uh, uh, 
Shantani did it. It did that he brought in kind of modernism into a place which was otherwise coming to the traditional ways of working. And uh, the first thing, I mean, I want to kind of bring to your attention to is that this little, I mean, tension between what, I mean, in terms of science, I think, begins his career as a student and artist. Between the kind of realism that he practiced before coming to Shantanika as a self taught and the, the style of the Bengal school that we saw. So this is a portrait of his mother, which he did while he was uh, a student in Shantanika in the very early years. So we can see that he was still practicing for various reasons. Of course, this is not Sometimes he did these things to earn some money, but this obviously is not a good thing for getting some financial assistance. This is something that he did for himself, this portrait of his mother. And there were several works of his time. Now that coexists alongside works like these, where you can see that he was subscribing to the Bengal school to be of doing things. Now both these things should be happening together. I mean, like, I mean, one would expect an artist to make a choice either this way or that way. But he seems to be trying to work in both these directions at the same time. Now, we can see that these kinds of engagements with, I mean, contrasting or opposing possibilities and its dynamics throughout his work, I mean, throughout his character. And this is something that probably separates him from the rest of his contemporaries at Chandra. Now, as I said that, I mean, very often it's said that he was the man who was responsible. I mean, uh, unlike his contemporaries, his mentors, his colleagues, I mean, to initiate a serious engagement with this. And brought in a wave of modernism into Shantini Nathan, which was governed otherwise by commitment to parks, to nationalism, and so on. Now, this is not altogether untrue, but it is a partial perception. And why is it partial? Because when we look at the history of Shantini Nathan, we can see that before Shantini arrived in Shantini in 1925, there were already a lot of engagement with I mean, world art traditions, including I mean, modern Western art, uh, which was happening there. Now, one of the central figures in bringing this about was Rabindranath himself. Now, on his travels across the world, he always made it a point to go to the museums, to look at what was happening, if possible, to meet people. So he did have these interactions. He had, when he went to Japan, he did the work, wrote about it very sensitively, but when he went to Europe, he did the same thing. He was probably one of the only Indians, probably, who went to or significant, I mean, the form of art history and art practice, who saw the Armory show in 1930, and it should have been like at one big kind of exposition. He saw everything that was made in the West until 1930 including Duchamp's early paintings. So you can see this is an exposure to the whole history of Western novels. He went to the ethnographic museums and saw in England and Germany, he saw I mean, collections of I mean, primitive art. And uh, Paris, even probably before, even during his very first trip, and uh, he probably ended up in Paris and saw the, one of the universal expositions which was on there. And he might not have thought about these issues at that point. Now, definitely when he first went to Europe, I mean, maybe what, 1896 or something, he was not thinking about all these things. There was an exposure. But by 1913, he was definitely thinking about these issues. That before this year, we know that when he was in London and he and uh, Rhoda was there, and he definitely expresses a desire to meet him. He met Catholic Conrad on another occasion when he went to Germany. So he was meeting a 
number of things you want to is talking with them. I mean, uh, so whatever be the case, he had a certain familiarity with modeling. And he was on his trips from outside. He was always bringing in catalogs, books, and so on. So the library there did have a considerable I mean, amount of material I mean, that relates to kind of thing. And in fact, I mean, the German publisher was also the person who was very closely associated with the Expressionist movement and uh, <coughs> published the magazines like the German Lover. So definitely there was a lot of these links that he was bringing in much with programming the game there. Now, similarly in I mean, 1920, when he went to London, he listened to a lecture by Stella Cranbridge and uh, invited her. She wanted to come to India. She was looking for a way of coming to India and furthering her research work on Indian art. And uh, Tagore invited her to come to Shamani. So she used that opportunity to find and also his friendship with various people in England, including Rothenstein, to get a visa. Being a Jew and a German, it was not very easy, and so he, she manages to get this travel permit to come to India. And she spent, I mean, her first one and a half years in Shantani. And uh, the, I mean, and Rabindranath was very keen that she saw a lecture about Western art and modern art to the teachers and students there and uh, insisted that the teachers and students attend these things and sometimes also acted as a translator. So definitely he had a big interest and it was something that was taken quite seriously and she is supposed to have covered according to people like you know we had a starting with Gothic art and moved up to Dadaism which was a fairly up to date kind of practice at that point. The next year, of course, she was also instrumental in bringing the Bauhaus exhibition, maybe with some encouragement from Rabindra, but she played a major role in getting that exhibition to help her. And somewhere in between, there was also this person called Andrew Carpele, who was kind of friendly with the tattoos, I mean, with Rabindra and Rabindra. And uh, she taught for a while. And she was somebody who painted in a broadly post impressionist manner. And she taught graphics, filmmaking, and uh, um, painting there for a while. So she, there were all these people there. And in fact, her sister, I mean, Susan, was also somebody who was very close to the, some of the modern writers uh, in Paris. So Champagnan definitely was not unaware or close to what modernist happenings uh, that were in the West. So Ramkita in a way arrives in 25 into a place which was already, I mean, had this possibility there. I mean, there was a history of this engagement. And uh, there was a small archives of books and images that he could consult. And uh, of course, side by side, there was a strong lineage of indigenous modernism that they were trying to so there were both these things in that period. So he was someone who was trying to, I mean, uh, not, I mean, probably bring in something which is not there, but trying to use those possibilities which is already there in a much bigger way than most of his contemporaries did. And that's probably why we look at some of the other artists. Nandalal, of course, was very nationalistically inclined, and, but at the same time, he had various modernist interests. Now, what he really did in a sense was to subsume all of those Western elements he saw in practice within Eastern elements. Western codes of structuring meaning, I mean, like the way one would do with Kiristalu, uh, he would try to bring that into a calligraphic form. And he was interested in the pictorial flatness that many artists were I mean, pursuing. But he would probably reinterpret it within the framework of 
I mean, oriental decorated arms, like Japan and so on. So you can see that some of the things that he was noticing, or we can notice in Western art, he was trying to bring them within frameworks of realism. You know, Behari also did something similar, but with an even stronger awareness of Western art. And in a way, I mean, the scholars sometimes speak about Rovito Shongi, I mean, and say that, you know, melody dominates, but if you listen carefully, there is always a substratum of harmony working beneath it. And they are trying to demonstrate various colors how this works. So in a sense, I mean, in the case of Vinod Bihari's painting, we can probably say something similar, that there is this predominantly oriented surface, but beneath that there is also an awareness, a strong awareness and understanding of what the West was trying to do. Ravindranath I had already referred to, and uh, his interest in Western modernism, I mean, as a mode of expression, and how he also looked at the primitive and non Western Indians at the same time and saw various kind of correspondences between these two things, and in a way, paved the way for kind of solving this kind of antagonism within the East and the West that was central to the early nationalist politics. I mean, right even during the Sodeshi days, I mean, Tango was trying to kind of, I mean, kind of smoothen those things. And he definitely didn't want to enter into that politics in the same way. Tries to steer Shantanigaran out of it. So that was also there. So we can see that if you look at the works of these three predecessors, now that produces a rather kind of complex environment, which is not all moving in the same direction, but a space which has various possibilities within it, and various possible trajectories are available for young people to choose from. Now, he just again, I mean, kind of leave one of these possibilities and choose the other exclusively. When you look at the work, you see that he tries to, I mean, kind of work with both these, I mean, possibilities. Now, let's turn to a few. So this is a drawing by Nambala. I mean, just to show you, maybe around the time that Ram people arrived there, which should be around 2013. But 29 or 30. But you can see that Nantala kept up a kind of practice of doing kind of kiraskirals kind of thing, which is probably nothing to do with the Bengal's glory. This was something that he kept occasionally practicing, especially his drawings. And you can see this on the other hand. This is something as early as 1970. I mean, so about 13 years before that previous work, 12, 13 years previous work where you can see a kind of, I mean, ink painting with a strong, I mean, undercurrent of cubist way of, I mean, dismantling things. Or, I mean, calligraphy which kind of tries to make these two things meet. Because scholars of, I mean, especially Japanese calligraphy, very often think that there was this element of uh, Chinese calligraphy. In fact, calligraphy painting. I think there was a certain element in the way that those people were trying to break the whole, I mean, uh, way of formal representation of the Renaissance and these kind of structure of calligraphy painting. So he did this, and as you can see, this even more clearly in this kind of thing. An awareness of volume of Hibriscoro, etc. is there. You can see some of those things, especially those darker areas, are almost like which will come from a periscope rendering of all it, but then he tries to kind of work it within the calligraphic structure. Or the fraternia, which you find in all of this kind of thing, tried, I mean, brought it to within the framework of the way the devotees or the hyperbole or his illustrations. So these are all things which he did between, I mean, I'm showing you works which he did between 1920 and 30 while he, he was, I mean, Ramkinder was there, I mean, as a student. And uh, some of 
some of the other things. There was an engagement with the real world, definitely, which I mean, Abdullah I mean, kind of focused, and also with his drawings like this, which you did of the local landscape, and there were all things that places we see that strong people met. There was a strong sense of the real being present in the world. Or we you know Bihari, I mean, we can see similar things. I mean, he might have been in his temperament like the Taoist kind of, I mean, far eastern artist. But um, you can see his familiarity with Western ways of rendering of kind of Germanic realism, I mean, uh, I mean early Renaissance realism kind of work, or a, a familiarity with the uh, expressionistic traditions of his own time. And so these are definitely present. He might be doing local landscapes, he might be working with uh, mediums that might be not very obvious in Western in their origins, but definitely have all in this great world. Mural where, I mean, the presence of early Italian Renaissance, I mean, is very strong. And where again he combines elements that he takes from uh, Oriental traditions like Indian, I mean, relief sculptures, I mean, as, as, as Mahabharata, or, I mean, scrolls of by Japanese painters like Sukhasu and so on. So there might be elements and there are individual motifs that he draws from various sources, I mean, in artistry. So all this overlaps with this. So you can see that it is not limited in a narrow way to an Orientalist kind of legacy. Or this, where you can see a certain kind of understanding of what a post way of handling the forms in space, definitely. Our not when it's doing, I mean, which draws your attention to the familiarity Arts. And uh, more or less Rabindranath and Brahmin, the scabulous overlap, or at the beginning of Rabindranath's scabulous as an artist, I mean, he begins to scribble in a very serious way, doing images like that, and drawing from 1924. And by 28, that Brahmin is, I mean, uh, in his third year or so, he's already painting and his paintings in the visit of the Italy. And in 30 onwards, much more. So definitely, there are also examples like this before me, which again points to various aspects like of European, I mean, uh, art or to, I mean, arts of various other cultures like the Chinese here, art nouveau, and so on. So we can see that these were all there. So Ramanuja's engagement with modernism took place against an existing background both of practice and a certain theoretical engagement. And secondly, we also notice that his involvement in sculpture begins around 1928 through the agencies of visiting Western artists. And most important of these visiting Western artists was Margaret Milburn, who was in India to do ethnographic portraits of various tribes. And during that trip, she also did portraits of various individuals, I mean, including I mean, uh, Rabindana, uh, and Kubrauz and Sheridan, and people like that who he thought whose faces kind of attracted. And in fact, when she did her uh, ethnographic portrait, she was doing it at very <coughs> Maybe not like most others did, in the sense that she would be drawn to individuals within those tribes that she was representing. And it was not that typical face that she was looking for in the tribes, but those individual faces that she was attracted to. Partly maybe because of her own background. She was, I mean, uh, I mean a student of Gupta, and uh, before she, I mean, uh, started on a ethnographic career. She was for many years his assistant. And so she was familiar with that whole post Pradhanas tradition of uh, sculpture and portraiture. And probably that also got reflected in the way she did that ethnographic work. Now while she was there in Shantanikeva, she 
demonstrated how to do portraits and things like that to the students. And Ram Kinga was I mean, almost in his final year at the French came. And uh, the other thing she did was she also did various live lectures, I mean, uh, on um, European sculptures of that period, especially of Ram Brother and so he did get introduced to this aspect as a student through these interactions with especially Margaret Mary. And this is one of her pieces. This is the kind of work she did. And you can see it was not the normal kind of work we see in museums. I mean, her work is there in the and uh, fairly fact. A couple of years ago, I think there was a whole seminar devoted to her work as somebody was negotiating between the ethnographic and the creative. So you can see from her work that definitely she was not the run of the mill kind of ethnographic artist. And you can see something that Ram Kinder did at the same time portrait of I mean, a gentleman who moved from his own place in, the, in this village and who was father to somebody and a good friend of his. So he did this portrait and you can see that probably Margaret Mendel's way of working and doing things did influence. It also influenced in other ways. I mean probably I mean in the way he looked at things. This one is his own work I mean from the early thirties. The other one is uh, a method by Gurudev, because when she came to Shantanaya, she gifted this small plaster cast to the museum <coughs> there, and it's still there, it's like it's broken, but it's still there. And uh, so he definitely had this model, and you can see that how this model could have influenced him, even in terms of the posture, the way, the everything being taken out of that. Now, we might assume that Ramakrishna was interested in anatomical kind of focus on the Santals and his interest in monumental federation. Now, all of these elements should have been at least initially encouraged by his contact with Margaret Mendel because the trials were her models. I mean, of course, it's not that artists in Shandana were not drawing them before that, but they were drawn. But besides that, she was looking at them as models and the whole idea of I mean, anatomical study in that Western way came with the intervention. Because Nandala didn't like doing, I mean, studies from post models, but he allowed that to happen in sculpture. Now, because uh, most of these artists at that time, including people who were belonging to what we might call the nationalist school, they thought what they were saying applied to painting but not the sculpture. Sculpture needed other ways of doing things, including studying in life with models and so on. So in some way they did get some permission to do I mean studies with models. After this, he also got people from the Calcutta Medical College to I mean give lectures on anatomy, which all these people attended and in fact there are drawings made in these anatomy classes. I mean, notes done by, you know, the Ramdinga has been left uh, sending such document, but the Nubi Hari has these things that he kind of did in these lectures on anatomy and what were being said and things like that. So, I mean, the introduction of sculpture definitely modified some of the ways in which, I mean, things were practiced. And even David Prasad, for instance, I mean, who studied painting under Avdeshuna, but studied sculpture under Hiran Mai And so he worked in two different ways as a painter and a sculptor. And they didn't find any contradiction in that. And uh, he was, sometimes he came to meet Nandala and Shanti and at those points, that was before Margaret Delbert came, that he would ask him to talk to his students about sculpture and talk about the practice of sculpture and things like that. So in a sense, there were two kind of uh, value systems or scales by which painting and sculpture was kind of measured or approached. 
during those days. So that also allowed him a certain kind of leeway as a person. Now, in a sense, if you look at what was happening to sculpture at that point of time, I mean, Ramkinder brings in a difference because, on the one hand, he is aware of what is happening and that kind of grounding that Nandala was trying to bring into Indian art education through a familiarization with the practices of Indian I mean, painting and sculpture, and at the same time being exposed to modern Western practices. Now, this was something that no other Indian sculptor before him thought of. Really. Because Devi Prasad might have learned until Avnin Sukha, but when he began to study sculpture, he almost had to forget that. It's a entirely different approach that he takes. It's a very highly Western academic approach to sculpture that he takes. And he didn't have this access to the language of Indian sculpture as. Um, now, this is why probably Shantanthi then becomes really, uh, significant in the way that Ramakita develops uh, later. Because, I mean, in most cases, Indian sculpture was studied from the point of view of iconography and archaeology rather than from the study of, from the point of aesthetics or formal elements at this point of time. And this was something that Nandala was doing because he always thought that the Indian mural traditions were very closely related to Indian sculptural traditions. So while he might not have been a sculptor himself, he was always drawing upon Indian sculptural traditions. And that was very important. And we see the coming together of both the modern Western and the Indian traditional sculptural traditions and practices in Brahmin this world. And this happens with the Sankar family, which in a sense is the first large monumental sculpture that you find in, by an Indian artist. I mean, David Prasad's works were done almost 20 years after this. So very often when you think that David Prasad, of course, was slightly senior to him as an artist, but, and therefore we, in our imagination, probably his monumental works would think belongs to his life in a real time. But it was Followed by, I mean, it was followed this structure by almost nearly 20 years. And to some extent, we can see how this element should have worked. While there was definitely the post reliance traditions in the West, he was aware of, but we can see the, the anatomical kind of comparability between, I mean, these early carbon structures. Now, um, we were talking about how the sometimes the simultaneity of various concepts. So that was done during 1938-39. And the next culture we did, interestingly, was very different from this, completely abstract. And uh, it grew out of all your drawings he was making at that point. You can see that, I mean, it would be very difficult to think that at the same time almost you have these two different kind of things exist. And in fact, you can see one more, I mean, kind of going back, if you look at the next word which you did, I'm not sure, which is a copy from the Aurangabad case. I mean, almost within a few months of doing this, which is very different, which is probably, I mean, you know, comparable to the so you can see him moving in and out in a sense. And these are the kind of drawings he did in the sketchbooks. And there are several sketchbooks of this kind. Besides, there are a large number of independent drawings. Now you see this coexistence of these contrary interests or styles, and we can see this happening throughout Ramkin the Stabbing. Now Although these two sculptures might look stylistically very different, they both show forms in rhythmic motion. Now, that might be the kind of thing that interested Ramping in various things. He probably didn't bother so much about the style or even the particular themes that he was running. 
but he was probably interested in some other kind of ways of thematizing things. And the movement was something that interested him. And cutting across all his cultures, the styles, you can see a deep interest in movement. And probably this was also something that he saw might be an element linking, I mean, traditional sculptures and the modernist movements. And both Binod Bihari and Ramfinger were more interested in the pre and post classical traditions of India. I mean, unlike the Bengal school, they didn't show much interest in the classical traditions of India, the Gupta and so on. But they would be interested in Pallava, they would be interested in, I mean, the kind of thing that you have in Ellora and post Ellora kind of things. But if you go through the sketches, if you go through the studies and what they take from Indian art, it is from these two phases, pre classical pre Gupta elements and the post Gupta, the medieval kind of thing. So these are the two areas that they draw on. So in a sense, you can see that where the amount of dynamics of movement is very strong. And this is what uh, probably, I mean, allowed me and, I mean, to look at Western art from X, Y, Z. He's interested in all those people. I mean, Epstein, for instance. Besides its poetry, I mean, the sculptures he is trying to do, many of them have this element of movement. I mean, rather, who they definitely have this element. So he's not so much concerned about styles, but the artists who are interested in art, artists who are also interested in the kind of, I mean, going away from classicism and breaking into kind of thing, and I mean, visualizing movement, uh, whether it be in abstract forms or whether it be in figurative kind of things. Now, we can notice that this was not, therefore, a kind of linear development that one would like to see. And modernist critics often like to see these linear developments, which is not there now. And probably as somebody who is responding to I mean, Western problems, many of these things came to him simultaneously. Impressionism, post-impressionism, cubism, I mean, futurism, all these things came to him at one go. He didn't see this as happening, I mean, over a period of time unfolding. And he didn't therefore think that there was any linear links, I mean, between them. But these were some possibilities which were available to him simultaneously as a creative person. And we'll see this happening in this book. Here again, you can see two words dealing with the same subject, both with Mithuna and then you can have entirely different ways of working. I mean, one which might be called extremely abstract, one with a lot of figurative expressions in television. <coughs> From 1940 or so when we saw that lamp stand and so this you can see and that abstract thing, you can see things there. Obviously, he was, has been looking at Picasso during this period, and there were a lot of issues of Cahedia art which is available to him in the kind of the library, and he should have been looking through those things because it's a lot of time that he could have been for that phase. Or things like that which pointed almost all of this one. And almost simultaneously, or just before that, you have a so, once again you see that he is probably not looking at things, I mean, necessarily in a linear logical fashion. So, I mean, these are kind of things that we can notice in art when he looks at these, I mean, kind of, they are all from the same period, I mean, almost very closely following one another. And sometimes we take the sculptures and along with that, then we create an overlap. This has been overpainted later, so in the original we do have a, I mean, an earlier color version from which you can understand it much more. <coughs>
Now, if we look at these words and we see this is the other aspect that I would like to focus on. Now, in his early work, the Sandals are shown as part of a rural peasantry. Now, in all these works, we see that he is showing them at rest or at work, and they are, I mean, always shown as very peaceful at the rest, or they are surrounded by the fruits of the labor, the harvesting, and so on. And you find this image of man, woman, children, and even the pets all huddled together in a very connival kind of context. And maybe forming what you might call a larger family. I mean, who are together in work, together in movement, if you take of the, I mean, the, the, the Sandal family sculpture, and together in rest. Now, even when they are big and monumental, like the Sandal family, there is an inherent lyricism to these images. Now, this is his vision of the Sangha people in the early phase of his work. Now, we see that somewhere towards the mid 40s beginning in 1943. Now, we see that this changes, probably because of the uh, famine and the, the war. I mean, that began around that time. And um, so this early images that we see, which is one of rural happiness, now uh, that gives a way to images of suffering, of death, I mean, images of togetherness <coughs> and nourishment gives way to images of strife and neglect. And the blissful mothers who are playing with the truth, those give a way to mothers who are kind of suck, being sucked dry by each other. There are quite a number of those images. I'll show you just two or three of them. So you can see the difference as well. This is, I mean, a work he did of uh, the cheese uh, stalls man. I mean, he had this shack and where, which was a favorite place where all the Shandian artists, including Mangala, and patronized this tea shop. And they used to have their discussion stops and thus under this tree there and one day he was found dead and it just coincided with the famine so he, this death of this man becomes a symbol of the famine for him or you can see that many of these people the peasants were turned from the farmers or peasants to laborers because that was a little job that was a, they moved into construction even in Shandhinikeda, at that point of time, there was a number of uh, construction activities taken up. And uh, so the Sangars moved into this area of big labors. And you can see that reflected in this work. And you can see it changes the relation between the mother and the child in the family. Or more in this kind of thing. The child, you can see, is neglected, no more part of the thing. And you can see this chain of labor probably happening because they were these skeletons hanging behind. And we often started with something that was there while they were digging for the foundations of some building there. They found some skeletons. So we did a couple of paintings based on that. One was where skeletons are shown lying on the floor, a gray painting almost like crushed white flowers kind of thing. I mean, and the other was this one. So you can see that he was, I mean, taking something that was immediate and turning it almost metaphorically and allegorically in these words. So his way of working had changed. His way of even using some of the, so he moves from his most post impressionist kind of way to a more, I mean, previous expressionist kind of way. All in his sculptures. Like this is the maquette he did for a larger work based on, I mean, that's something he had sent to the competition of the unknown political prisoner. And obviously, I mean, uh, the organizers had talked about the war and the war prisoners rather than in Bagram Kinkar's mind, the unknown political prisoner happened to be the peasant. And 
So we ask this method to make sense. Or as I said, the mother and child image. Quite kind of different. Literally you can see these children are now hanging by the press kind of thing. And uh, extremely distorted. There were more than one such work in such and also a painting where I mean you can see a mother really being kind of not one of those early mothers. Now, now you can see that if you think there was a kind of celebratory realism in the case of the world. Now in this, I mean and the kind of post-cubist exploration of the world about the same time, you can see that this gives way to fragmentation. And cubism is no more that way of observing the initial world, but of adding a kind of expression to this, I mean, despair to the image. Now, it might be still based on perceived or experienced facts. I mean, we never discontinues that as we saw that there might be some link to some little experience he has. And, uh, but then it sets him thinking and I mean it sets him kind of building allegories about <coughs> which is And they always try to draw our attention or focus to issues beyond what we just see and that becomes quite important. And we see that in the mid 50s there are signs of an ideological commitment. And he was never a member of the progressive artist of the arts group of the other kind of thing. But if you think about any artist around the mid 40s who came close to them in purpose and spirit, it would be Ram. So you can see that although he never became a member officially, you can see this coming close to now, in this new kind of situation, the tribal peasant, the Sangha, was no more, as he thought, in a romantic way, like a noble, savage, happy, active, and energetic and kind of thing. But he's becoming this anonymous political prisoner or the victim of an unjust and much more class society. That's the kind of relationship begins to come. Now he empathized with them throughout his career, even much earlier, and that man, their commitment to labor. You can see when he speaks about it, he's completely, I mean, stating about I mean, the middle class because it, they think that they are people who do work. There is no labor in their lives. There is no activity, no anything. On the other hand, he thinks the Sandals are the people who really are full of not compliance, energy, and I mean, just the people who work, and that was something which was very important. And uh, in whatever few statements we have from him on these issues, this is very clear. Very, very now, but at the same time, I mean, the 40s was also the time, I mean, beginning with the late 30s, into the late 40s, that about 30 years. That was also the time he did some of his greatest portraits. Maybe it began, let us say, by his portrait of Alauddin Khan in 1925, and followed by others, Tango, Amnita Nath, and so on. But a lot of these portraits were largely interested in the women, and that also shows that. They were people who kind of shared his modernist aspirations and with whom he kind of identified intellectually or emotionally. Now, so if his interest was there in the, the Santa fibers and he thought that they were the people who really worked and labored and definitely, I mean, antithesis to the middle class who, I mean, shunned labor altogether. But the portraits reveal another kind of empathy because this was also the, I mean, the cultural middle class which was the articles of modernism. So he really celebrates them individually I mean, uh, in his portraits. So 
these are some of the people, like young women who were there, but also some of those students of think who were accomplished, who did things. So Joshi, for instance, I mean, went into studying history and did a master's in history, taught. I mean, you know, so there were people who had kind of had various kind of so really fun Except in poetry, so we wrote Chaudhary, later married, I mean, Shambhu Chaudhary, while she was a student there. Um, Vira Chatterjee, I mean, Mathure, I mean, Sinkhaker, I mean, as I mean, Sri Lankan kind of student there. Or, uh, you know, they You'd see that there was each one of them was individual, and it was a celebration of these individuals who were not simply physically attractive, but also people who were much more intellectually aware, interested in things. And along with those three, four portraits of, I mean, um, iconic male figures like Tango, I mean, of Aladdin, uh, and And this one, of course, in uh, the you know, that it is and probably mix it. And he called this comedy. And, and he probably in a sense was expressing a desire to have people from his own milieu, his own kind of thing, people who wear this, you might say this cultural middle class, intellectual middle class that is emerging. And he wanted to find people with similar interests uh, from this group of people. Now, when you turn from these portraits to his paintings and sculptures, we see that while he was celebrating his individual skill in one piece, he was gradually becoming more and more openly elevated. And his works were becoming much more ideologically in those images, and becoming much more ideologically in the And one of the influences we see going through a lot of his work at this time was Picasso's painting. Now, also in a sense, the rhetorical use of Cubism in Quebec was probably something that uh, might have interested him. Um, which you see that then gradually rounding the, I mean, that his practice of basing his work on perceived of it, I mean, uh, facts of experience, facts, that begin to kind of, I mean, becoming thinner. And he might have still have a link, but then as he works, it moves away further, much further, then he's beginning to visualize images which are based on ideas or ideological perceptions. So the, the factual elements actually shrink in importance. Right. This is something, I'm showing you a series of works from the 50s. I mean, this was done at the beginning of that movie. And you see this thing. I mean, which too started from a small event, I mean, not small, but something very disturbing that you saw. I mean, uh, in the village people had buried their fetus, and uh, at night, some dogs or jackals, I mean, uh, kind of dug it out. And when he went to walk through the morning, he saw this. But that was the beginning. But you can see that beginning is completely buried in the metaphorical development of the tree. And all this one, which probably worked over a number of years, where I mean, you can see farmers breaking into a castle and turning cultivated. So this is a kind of extremely allegorical work. I mean, this is the only made of farmers and and that is something you can see repeatedly being there for all these things, quite a number of paintings, but nothing like that. And probably this might have been even a painting that began sometime in the 40s, but he continues to work on it for a while. It's very, very quick pigment you can see it has been worked over. And uh, in some sense, you can begin to now compare these works with some of the Italian artists that do so well. Or this one from the late 50s, where you see the entirely different picture of the peasants. I mean, from what we saw in the beginning of his career of 1940, 
where I mean first again the I mean first again is the children and then the relationship. The kind of uh, uh, even the cattle are famished in Vegas. The only I mean person of well being there is this man with the upper standing there and supervising. So definitely it's a kind of different image of presently uh, which from which we have seen before. The notion I mean of the proletariat was actually beginning in this one. Now uh, there were his peasants were no more free people. And it was not those people who he thought were blessed with natural human dignity, which was something that if you look at his southern family of I mean they were having simple people, I mean half dressed in a sense, but they had this sense of dignity, I mean which was definitely there in those communities. And the ability to celebrate life, that simply disappears. They were ill-treated, dehumanized and suffering. I mean, it's an entirely different image of um, the peasantry that arose. And <coughs> definitely his messages were also becoming a little more didactic uh, through these ideological communities. But it doesn't stop him from experimenting with formal elements at the same time. Once again, while he kind of looks into these uh, from a thematic position and tries to reconstruct the present, at the same time, he is still interested. I mean, you would think that he would not be interested in formalism at all. But he seems to be equally interested in formalism at this point of time. And uh, he moves towards greater fragmentation, more abstraction in this world, and uh, where probably the themes we saw and we can sometimes recognize the themes very easily. And uh, it is purely the pictorial orchestration that I mean that you notice in these works. Now but you can see that alongside abstraction we did images which are usually rhetorical things. Eminently readable. Now we can see these two things happening, I mean, almost simultaneously. Now, we also notice that in his spoken statements in interviews, he has always been critical of social space. And, but in his work, perhaps he moves closer to them. And we can see specific words probably influence the way he did things. And his own work, in a sense, becomes de individualized, gesture, in type, in all kinds of ways, and we see some of these. And probably subsumed to a larger kind of uh, overriding rhythm, which is also characteristic in a sense of a lot of socialist ways work. Uh, this is one where we can still see the imagery quite a bit, I mean, of, I mean, farmers transplanting, I mean, seed plates. But there are a couple of them around the same time where it's even more difficult than that. But at the same time, he's doing something like this, simultaneously, which is in a totally different way. And even this particular motive he did in different ways. I mean, there were lots of paintings where I mean, it was pulled into two opposite directions beyond. I mean, this is like a middle space. Like, if you look at this, this is more like the, I mean, you know, the socialist realist thing. I mean, the anatomy is gone completely, the con convention. I mean, there are no kind of things that works within the normal ideas. It's not convincing in terms of the kind of thing. Look at the press, the way they kind of think about the arms, they move. I mean, almost like a kind of, I mean, each individual reflecting, mirroring the other. Of this one. But he also did fairly abstract versions of the previous people. You can see that simultaneously he was doing all these things. Now, here too, you can see this is quite a kind of I mean, overblown up, I mean, valorized figure. 
Now we can see this two kind of thing, the valorization in a sense, we can see that it is very different from his own rendering of the peasants that we saw in the painting from say 57 the harvest. But he probably wanted to kind of move the peasant from the social periphery into the center and make it a kind of uh, Kind of inspirational mascot for the of the working class. I mean, for a kind of uh, ideological role. So we, we have two things. One was this highly, I mean, kind of monumentalized figure of the worker. The other was the worker as the, I mean, completely dehumanized, family, famished kind of person. And uh, the first he used a post previous style and here he uses something that is closer to socialist realism. Now these two contrary styles are two different thematic focuses which simultaneously engage him. And if you see these, within the context, you can see there were elements that allowed him to do that. There was a convergence of interest in these two things, if not a kind of convergence of means. And one of the things I found interesting was how this was happening even elsewhere. In the 1937 Universal Exposition, you had these two, I mean, kind of pavilions, the Spanish pavilion and the Russian pavilions facing each other, I mean, uh, in that uh, exhibition. One had the painting by Picasso, Dominica, in it which was in this post previous rhetorical theme, but which was very well contained by the architecture. The other had a very famous sculpture of factory worker and faculty farmhand on top of the building. So one was anti-fascist and spoke of destruction and suffering, which was, I mean, at least in Picasso's painting, bewildering and absurd and painful at the same time. The other was more like a call to arms, a planning call, let's say, by the socialist to unite, and an inspirational poster. Now, ground people, you can saw, I mean, you can see that saw this anti-fascism and socialism, and there's two different styles as two sides of the same point in some sense. This is how, I mean, looking at that, two pavilions might be interesting and very I mean, kind of instructing in itself. Now, when we normally see this painting in books, it looks large, huge, monumentous. But you can see that in the pavilion, it is really very small, and the pavilion itself is not huge. You can see the trees, I mean, you can around, and the landscape bit that you see, and you can therefore guess the scale of the pavilion and that of the painting. And the chairs also in the front, we allow you to do that. So, it was not that unusually monumental and large as it looks in the world. And you can see this on the other side. But just bang opposite it was this. And you can see it's so huge. Look at the figures at the bottom that gives you a I mean, sense of the whole dimension of the world. And look at the figure in relation to the architecture. So entirely different kind of things. And when he was starting the work at that time, you can see that he was normally trying to get both these things together in his work. So the valorizing anatomical exaggerations, which is associated with socialist realism, that, you might say, contains the seeds of political imagination. I mean, there is something there which is not I mean, although we call it the word socialist realism, but it's not about so much of realism, but of, I mean, kind of mythical valorization of the figures. Ramkinda seems to have recognized this and brings this to the surface of his own works from the 60s onwards. We see the mythical image of and the representation hyperbole converging in some of these paintings and sculptures. Now, but all through this, what really holds them together, all these different things, 
It's a kind of passionate humanity, a kind of un I mean, in fact, in sincerity, I mean, and belief in the human kind of, I mean, I mean uh, destiny, its future, its kind of thing, which seems to be an overriding feature in all these books. He chooses all through, I mean, to remain an involved and a passionate participant. Because this is important because in the 60s, there was people that trying to change this gradually. The artists were trying to have a more distant view of things. They were becoming much cleverer people. They were even when they are commenting on I mean, social reality, irony probably became much more important than raw emotions. Now you can see at that point of time in Brahmin there seems to be slightly exception and sticking to these uh, elements that was there probably more I mean feminine from people continues to stick to those things. So you see the mythical element coming through these images of uh, I mean, Nekal Chinese Rosh Rose and uh, or his anti war painting, both one at the same time. I mean one of course is a hero in a war, and the other is a totally anti war painting. What's the date? 69, Yes. So you can see both these things happening. Same time, the same year. So they are done on the same year, and you find these two very interesting elements happening. And both, in a sense, I mean, has a way of, I mean, a mythic way of dealing with those things. Or this one again, done at the same period. And in fact, this is interesting because in the initial drawings, probably he had something like, which you see in a lot of uh, socialist art, and especially political imagery at that time. There are two standing figures holding up a kind of batteries, a kind of flaming torch. That is where he starts with. And which is something that, I mean, you know, into the 70s, all of us when we grow, probably saw that it was a common image which was printed in almost every bit of literature, uh, pamphlet that they was printed. And he kind of turns that gradually into a completely different kind of thing, two mythical creatures. I mean, uh, Sorry, where is this? This is second, this is a magnet. But the large work is in that uh, auditory kind of thing that we have in Shantan here, opposite Palau. It is there. So you can see this kind of change that is happening. Did you refer to any the last one? He calls it the birth of fire. I mean, that it, it starts with that kind of I mean, figure of I mean, the drawings. It started with the image of a man and a woman holding up a torch. Together. I mean, uh, and then while working on it, sometime it got completely transformed. It became two horizontal figures, flying figures. I mean, mythical creatures rather than modern contemporary figures. And this is one of the last things that we did in 19, I think, 75. I mean, uh, uh, because there is this place, I mean, where you have a Kali temple and there is an animal, I mean, uh, kind of puja there where, I mean, those are sacrificed. So he does this on the basis of that people leaving a goat with a human face to be, I mean, be sacrificed. So he wanted this to be a large sculpture, and uh, of course this was, I mean, the last major work he did. How large is it? Sorry, how large? No, it is not very really small. I mean, this maggot is extremely It's a maggot. Yeah, it's a maggot. He didn't enlarge it. He wanted to enlarge it. He didn't enlarge it. It's a small maggot, uh, maybe 14, 15 inches. Now. You can see that, I mean, if you now look back at all of these people, and you can see that amongst his contemporaries, you know, Bihari was somebody who kept himself abreast of things happening around, but all of his ideological commitments, whatever they were, he kept them rather discreet. He never allowed them to spill into this world. I mean, not that he was not observant or he was not sensitive to things, but he 
he never allowed that to come into his words. He remained a distant observer and he was probably more concerned as a painter and artist with much more preliminary questions. The only time in a sense where he addresses it a little bit is in the living room, but otherwise he doesn't do it. Nandala of course was more openly political, but he did not express his I mean, uh, political ideas through the subject matters he chose. He used it more as a substractive, informing the various kinds of activities he did. And uh, so it was more in what he was trying to do, erasing the difference between high arts and low arts, in trying to be interested in crafts, in trying to get various levels of practices together. Now, in these kinds of ways, he really probably brought in this political ideology to work more and much more, I mean, uh, fruitfully than in the subject matters. Tagore also was somebody who gave many his political ideas through his writings and I mean, openly he discussed it in his essays and uh, also in his novels, in his theatre. But when it came to painting, he probably didn't have the resources to do that. Or chose, like in music, where he had the resources, but he chose largely not to do that and not to become a commentator on the contemporary world. And this was actually what Brown did differently. He was, amongst these four artists, someone who chose to be a political commentator on the surroundings which the others do. It's not so much about style, it's not so much about thing, but this choice that he makes as an artist, which I think keeps him a little separate from the other three. And you can see that in the studio, especially in the later years, that his, I mean, uh, ideas and ideological commitments prevailed over his, I mean, uh, immediate physical experience. And, but when he worked outside the studio, the spontaneity of his responses kind of continued in the same way as it did early in his early I mean, works of the studies and forms. And this comes through a great deal in his watercolors. And in his watercolors, I do believe that the style of shifts that we might notice was more related to the motif rather than to that a particular motif would demand a particular kind of treatment and he worked towards that. So that is another aspect we see uh, in those things. And then in these monographs we can also see that he was probably much more closer to the oriental legacies of Nauti and Nautala and so I will end by showing you a few of these books. This is something that he did in 44 when he went to Nepal. And these mountains and those flat landscapes somehow made him use these courses as this kind of way of working. And almost all his words from that phase and this energy. Of course, later when he moves to Shillong, I mean, about four or five years later, I mean, uh, the way he worked changes. Although there's a mountain of it and all of the atmosphere, all of the thing comes through. And this is, in fact, a drawing by Nandala. I just put these things in between just for us to see that also the, where they meet, where they don't look so different, so alien to each other. This is again a Shillong drawing by Nandala. And this is a large drawing by Nandala. You can see that they are on a kind of almost similar plane and we can now see Shilong by Rangi and the Kuri landscape, Kovaru by Siski. Kind of Kuri and Siski by Nandala. And this is my So you can see that 
while in so many ways they differ, but when you look at certain segments of the world, there was also something that when they were both responding spontaneously to what they saw and using of the languages, you can see there were things that these two artists would share, and uh, which is probably as important as the other differences that we noted. So you can see that he is not completely detached from the whole uh, uh, kind of art practice that Shaman did. He, he definitely brings a whole new dimension to the Mozart, but he is also tied to it in various ways. And the picture is much more complex than one would think. I mean, if you take any one of these elements, it would probably give us a much simpler uh, kind of thing. But if you look at the whole thing together, the picture that emerges is a much more complex.
Gandhi says, I don't need a trained kind of thing. I need a kind of uh, fitbit who will be able to handle it. So this, and then it was an experience of Gandhi because Gandhi made certain conditions that if I school for instance, you say I will give you this much money and you have to get everything done within that much money, which was a small amount. So it was also a kind of education for Nandana in terms of how do you kind of do something which is creative, which is kind of thing, it can directly reflect again thematically an idea. But in practice it was, I mean, I had an idea all the time because you were trying to put Gandhian ideas, I mean, into practice to show it. This is not, in a sense, Gandhi was forcing Nandala to do. That use only local materials, use only whatever skills that are available there, and use only this much of money. It was something like 2,000 rupees or something he gave for price. So it was, I mean, quite a small thing to do such, do such a huge kind of thing and organize an exhibition around it. So these were extremely educating for Nandalal as an artist and very important for his growth as an artist. And uh, what he was trying to do in a sense, I mean like even at Alipura, was to evolve a concept of total designing. I mean it's not every part of that township from his materials, engineering to building it up to decorating it and relating that to the kind of people who come there. Now, somebody, an artist, trying to do all these things. I mean, I don't think there would be many examples of that kind of involvement. So this relationship, which was still, I mean, you should remember, it's not the state. I mean, at that point of time. I mean, it might have been the leading political party, but not the state. And the only thing we really, which we can say the state, is when the constitution is done. But in a way, the constitution is also the final I mean, act of that whole independent movement of self-determination in a sense. But after that, I mean, he himself never participated in any of these things. Maybe it was a very, yeah? Participate in any of the Congress things after that. But some of his followers did at least one more time in 1958, and which I think was a disaster because by then it was no more the people, it was not no more the nationalist voice. But it was the party that they were associated with. And also, I mean, they were, I think, less innovative people definitely. And they just didn't go. Ramkinko, although he worked along with the founders for quite some time in his early years before coming to Ramkinko, after that, he probably never participated in any type of, I mean, still directly political interaction at that time. So, except, I mean, uh, that he did this um, commission work of the, the uh, Reserve Bank here, which was again a disaster because for various reasons he didn't know how to handle the commission. He didn't even know how much money to pay for it because these were people who lived with a salary of 50 rupees, 100 rupees and so on. So a lack of rupees looked like a huge kind of money. I mean, like, the maximum amount we can imagine, kind of. So, and which proved to be so little for, and then as an artist, like many modern artists, it didn't stop him from imagining things and doing things, and once he got into it, the time frame was absolutely forgotten. He spent a lot of money trying to travel to different places, looking for the right kind of store, color, and so on. And Almost the entire money was exhausted before he could even take out the stones for really. So which put him in a lot of trouble. I mean the reserve bank obviously was sticking to its contract that we are supposed to deliver this within this period, within this money which is allotted. And there was no money, there was the time was over because he was when he started with the sculpture, he got carried away with the kind of thing. There are about, I mean uh, 13, 14 markets that he did for that and new novel drawings and uh, recently they also found there is a market besides that we know of. There is also a market in the reserve bank itself. So you have two more figures in fact to what we saw in that last exhibition. So really he 
was carried away by his whole idea and he was kind of maybe working on it, forgetting the time frames that he did. So he never did any public sculpture which was a kind of uh, kind of sponsor or commission. I mean, all that the work he did in Shantanagaran, he simply got some material and there was no time frame, no kind of thing. So he could only work it within those kinds of things. He couldn't fit into the whole thing, temperament to me, or he didn't probably even understand how these things were. So, I mean, in that sense that it was a kind of thing. So the other Gandhi thing was that he did, that Shivji was referring to, he did it as a personal kind of homage. I mean, in fact, he did it according to some sources. On the day, on the night, he heard of the death of Gandhi. So it was an emotional response immediately after he died. And uh, the one we see now is probably the second version. The first version was not even, I mean, it was a much more you know, stout of factor Gandhi that we see, so it has nothing to do with the, with the larger head, the kind of a totally a slightly distorted kind of Gandhi that he was which if what we hear is true, was done on the I mean, night of his assassination. So it was a quick emotional response that he had brought of that. And he had a great admiration for Gandhi, and also as a person probably he represented to him I mean, that sense of vitality and movement. That is what he associates Gandhi with whenever he speaks about it. He says movement, speed. This is, I think, the two words. I mean, he associates it. So it's something that we see in his works, in his sculptures. So there was this personal problem as a creative person, this personal association and identification effect with Gandhi. It's his uh, skull, uh, image of his skull and his feet. Yeah, I, I personally feel this image that he captures. Very often it is compared to said, the Dundee march, that Gandhi walking in that kind of thing. But I think that what he had in his mind was not the Dundee march, but the, okay. the Naukali thing. I mean, that, uh, the, that was the final triumphant moment of Gandhi in a sense. And that is more the kind of thing kind of figure triumphing over death and violence. And I think this is what really he can think. Because under that sculpture, when he enlarged, it is a bad enlargement by the student. I mean, basically. And uh, it's called, I mean, uh, a council of non violence and So people think, why this skull under his feet? But he had probably in mind not the Dante March. I mean, which had its political significance. But I think as a kind of uh, human document that the other one, Gandhi was more important. You know, Gandhi of Namakar, that is, I think, what is uh, probably inspiring and what he tried to do. So, the more questions? Yeah. So, you know, you have to go to the question is concentrated on the Kinder days, but in the case of Nangla Mosi, they mentioned the openly. Uh, probably doesn't relate to that at all. I mean, see from about, it happens much later. His own commitment comes a little later than that. That painting is not saying that he not fight. And he doesn't commit himself to these issues before 1910. And uh, when he did that painting, that he was still a student, probably in his first year in college. So you talk about such a lot about that work, but that was the work of a first year student. I mean, uh, where his ideas and ideologies are not formed. And you can see his political ideas taking shape. I mean, political ideas in the sense, I'm not saying referring here to definitely, clearly identifiable kind of thing, but a certain perspective coming into shape. 
by about 1910 in several ways. One is interest in neural sleep, which at that point of time, the word they used for neural was not public art, but civic art. And this was something that his contemporaries, including his teacher, was not interested in. But the nationalists like Havel and Nivedita were speaking of. And he takes a great interest in that. So that is one kind of point. The second point would be that he's interested in folk arts. And for a time he stops painting and in the normal Bengal school manner. And he goes to a rural outpost just outside Calcutta where he used to live. And he began to paint like the cardinal thought, but to us, producing pictures and selling them cheaply because there was some jute factory around. So he was trying to sell it to the jute factory workers <coughs> at one paise or something like that. So in fact, he did it for a while and this reached, I mean, Abhinitana. He heard this <coughs> what he was doing. So one day he called him and said, show me all your works. So he brought all these things and showed him. He said, so how many of them are there and what are you selling these for? So he bought them all up and he said, from tomorrow you will come here and sit here and work. Kind of thing. So in a sense, because Abhinitana probably thought this man who was wasting his talents and moving in some direction, so he wanted to bring him back. But uh, later on, Nangala comments, probably Abhinitana didn't realize the social significance of what I was trying to do. So you can see that his attitude to the national and to the kind of political was being formed at that point of time, not in 1905 in his first year in college when he was painting something. Obviously not. They are probably, and also what happens with most of these figures that I think with all of us as people, you know, in the first beginning, we are probably guided by what is around us much more than what others tell you, what kind of thing, and what you think as the, uh, the great figures of our times tell us. But it's only when we battle it out and we move ahead that we formulate our own positions, our own ideas, a way of relating to things. So if you have to look at Nandala, one has to look at it through those, I mean, chronological kind of things that it does and what he is moving to this. And rather than picking up on that one thing, which might be very problematic for us today, but you should also remember that sir, probably in his first year in college, he joins in 1905. And soon afterwards, he paints that. It, of course, wins him an award, makes him kind of popular at that point of time. But if you look at the perspective of Ram, I mean, Mangala's work, that doesn't figure in there. Okay. I think, does that answer you? Yeah. When I said openly political again, I was not saying that Ram Kinka was not open. I was only saying that in terms of the response of participating in the nationalist movement, Nandala was open politically, that participation. Ram Kinka, after his first years, where he also did posters, he did portraits of nationalist figures, banners, things like that, where he was participating in directly. I mean, whereas Nandala kept doing those things throughout at least two thirties he did carry the practice. Whereas Ramkinda didn't directly participate in any of these nationalist I mean, movements or kind of events. I mean, that is all what I mean. So when you, uh, when you are talking about Ramkinda's work, we talk about how he looks at the world as there was one view which is unidimensional and multidimensional. When you talk about Ram Kinder, he draws about the tensions between the two. Could you please give us some, some examples and you know, explain how it manifests in his work? No, like I was trying to do things. So, for instance, I mean, let us say his interest in, from time to time, I mean, you can see his interest in people around him as human beings, as kind of people who and how he perceives them and how he, how he thinks about them. That would be one thing. And which is a highly focused engagement with the reality of it. And it is also shifting with historical kind of events. Now, at the same time, you can see that he has an equally keen interest in, say, the formalist languages of art, especially of modernism. And 
externally, at least in many ways, they might look like opposing involvement. I mean, things, two different kind of things, which probably one doesn't necessarily, I mean, entail the other. But they are two different strands of this involvement, which it tries to bring them in various ways. And now, sometimes there is a kind of, one might look at the work and say, complete conflict of interest. For instance, when he is doing paintings where which are not legible at all, which are only can be seen as formal constructions. Now that is coexisting with paintings where there is a very legible thematic focus and even a kind of I mean social statement which is being made. Now these are entirely different kinds of things and he is sometimes doing them with the same subject matter. And one painting you have this, and you can see, I mean, like, I didn't show you all the works maybe pertaining to one particular theme, maybe show you two or three. But if you take the entire spectrum of that, that would be that. And uh, so he didn't, very often what happens with many artists is that when you take one of these, you try to overlook the other aspect altogether. I mean, this is what I want. This would not be so unusual if he was um, aware of which he was by the thirties of uh, botanism across the uh, world. Picasso, for example, if you Picasso, we have an eminent example of working simultaneously and in, contradic in contradiction and going, uh, you know, uh, uh, more or less overturning and inverse, inverting his own proposition. So that would come as much from his own experimental mode within Chantanikitan as it would from his whatever lessons he would draw from uh, Western modernism as well. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I mean, Castro definitely is one important example and I said that, I mean, especially, I mean, uh, if you look at the copy onwards, you can see Castro serves him as a model. Both uh, for the problems. And uh, then from, I mean, uh, late copies, you can say Gurnika becomes a very important reference point for who? Gurnika becomes a very important I mean, reference point for a lot of his work. So you have that. I mean, but when I made the statement, I was only thinking in terms of the artists around him, uh, the kind of thing, and also within the Indian part of the scene. I mean, obviously you have a figure like that. So even in a sense, someone like the Tuso was something trying to straddle between these two things. So those things were there. But Around him <coughs> here at that moment, we don't find any figures. Was he aware of the future? I don't think so. I don't, I don't think imagine so. because the future was not, not very popular. But you can see what really, maybe because of the circumstances they were in, yeah. the kind of commitments they had. I mean, they probably had some parallels. You can see sometimes, I mean, some images look quite close to each other. Some of the themes look close, like the, uh, the farming in the castle that I talked about. There is a similar painting by the two of uh, peasants taking over land and kind There is, I mean, uh, this valorized figure of the Samsara women, I mean, uh, drinking a cup of tea. That, uh, similarly, this really global figure of an Italian man, I mean, peasant, of the world, kind of eating I mean, spaghetti. <coughs> you know, kind of things. I mean, you can even see that the imagery they developed in various parts of time of that looks comparable. Yeah, I think. So very good. Yeah. Uh, Ramkinder, most of his uh, public work, as you said, outdoor work, yeah. obviously had work of sculpture. Uh, but there was also this uh, uh, mural tradition, which is a form of, of public work outside. This is painting, uh, which has been done in Shantini Kater, both inside and outside. Uh, he somewhere made a comment that for him, painting was done in the studio and was he in some senses like saying that the public work I position myself and nobody else is doing or even can do uh, in terms of sculpture that he never attempted to do a 20 foot big uh, mural painting is there some explanation of why he was very determined to keep painting as an activity with watercolor and music painting no, I think partly this might have happened because of um, his preference for oil paint, working on canvas. Um, but some of the work 
although they are, I mean, may not be painted, but reliefs can be seen as murals in a sense. Yeah, like, pretty, but it's not the. Uh, yeah, not the kind of thing. Uh, he might have participated in some of the early works as a student, but um, and after that, you can see that almost every time there is a work which is taken up. And this line is also not uh, very strong because although Nandala never did sculptures, he did a lot of those reliefs on this um, building, Shamani, where Rambi, where they those three, I mean, two things on the front door and one on the side. The rest of the reliefs are all done by students working under Nandala. So Nandala also worked on those things. Or if you look at the Black House, I mean, their work was done under the supervision of Nandala as well as Rambi. Some of the inner ones were done under Nandala's supervision. Some of the outer ones were done under Rambi's supervision. So in a sense, he didn't participate in all these things. Whenever there was a project, he did do something there. Or in Chinabon, the external reliefs, I mean, traffic kind of reliefs were done by students working under Rambi. But the inner ones were done, the main two papers were done by Nandala. So he did participate in these things, but obviously through the medium of reliefs and that. Because he didn't work in all those mediums that were used for mural paintings there. And fresco, <coughs> tempera, and these things he didn't work. Almost from 30 onwards, he was working exclusively in all this. And so that might have been one reason that he did think about or participate in the mediums. And uh, I mean, simultaneously also had all these cultural projects and relief mural projects in the sense of way. So those two things might have been responsible. I want to put in something that you were yesterday. You just mentioned, yeah. sorry, that you mentioned in passing is this uh, remarkable abstract sculpture called Mitsuna yeah. 2. Yeah. And you have in your text, it's not in the that you dated in roughly 1929 uh, or 30, and just about 24. I mean, for me, it is such a complex yeah. uh, piece of, of Cubist work, which is mythal uh, about sexuality, neuroticism. Uh, I mean, I think for me, in a sense, if you say Santal family, you know, was the great achievement. I think that this particular work is such a marker in the advancement of Indian modernity. And I even, I mean, an art historian like you, who take this work, whether Picasso did such a complex work or anybody else in Europe at that moment, uh, is something worth uh, investigating. And I think this, I mean, could be foregrounded. And because you are very really interesting thesis on reading your book carefully, with which you elaborated very exceptionally well, is this relationship between abstraction and figuration? But most people think of, you know, the great Santal and the main whole family and the figurative work. If you have now put them almost in part, and therefore this Mithun uh, too is something really uh, worth studying in, in exceptional degree. No, I, I do agree with you, but uh, as I said, there is a little, I mean, uh, lack of clarity of the precise date. Because I, as I said, the only way I found there was some reference from someone contemporary saying that who knew him at that point in time, that he did the series of time. Like this one stands out from the rest of the thing. There are about three works, and including one further one which was done later, four. So whether if he did all of them at one go <laughs> that 28, 30 phase. Or if this actually happened a little later, I'm not very clear. But I would still date it as something, one of his earlier books, earlier to the, I mean, uh, the, I mean, the Sandal family. And uh, definitely, as you said, I would agree with you that this is a uh, much more important work than the, all the other books that he did at that point of time. And it has this energy, this kind of vitality and this way of bringing the figure to back the painting, which also comes in the second later version, quite a bit. But you can see that this definitely was something that engaged him from, say, about 28 to 29 onwards till about 1940. And this work might fall 
they're <coughs> close, I mean, towards, I mean, 33, 34, something I mean, I have a feeling that it may not do things. Although I didn't get any documentary evidence to place it there. And the only documentary evidence I got was to place it in the area. So I just left it there. I mean, somewhat hanging for the moment. And uh, what you see is that you right I do think that that book stands out from even the rest of his other books. I mean, I have cut them together. It does stand out from that. And it's much more complex and much more evolved and I think much finer the kind of realized kind of thing. And uh, should probably find a more important place on that. And just one more first quick about uh, abstraction and sculpture. It's not written in your book, but in Devi Prasad for speed. Yeah, yes. In fact, the word speed yes. comes constantly, you know, in this thing. And uh, the simplicity of it mm -hmm. is, is remarkable, and it's abstraction. And, uh, and in fact, it would be an incredible piece of large public sculpture. This is relatively small, and it sort of reminds me of you know, uh, jumping into the 60s and 70s, when yes. there was an attitude to sculpture, like Anthony Caro, yeah. if you take a piece of steel, but what this work is, it's just something that goes and turns around like that. So it could just be one piece that's turned. And the simplicity of that, and the, and the energy that it's sort of proposing, uh, if you could bend steel like Caro could, you yeah. would have done something like that. Sure, I mean, that is another work, and unfortunately, I couldn't get a really good photograph. It should be. It was, it was about a little more than four feet high, and uh, it was on a large, tall pedestal. So it was, uh, it was a pedestal cage over four and a half feet, the then it was on the top of that. So it was a Look, very. Yeah, that yeah. little ground looks uh, quite neat. Yeah, so it was a very imposing thing. But the one which we see. Normally, I mean, a slightly more finished piece, of version of that, is a plaster mat, and which I don't know where it is now. So, except that, I mean, the photograph which was available was also not. I mean, you know, when you recopy, you can give you the the total quality of the surface. It was too flat, and then <coughs> the other one was destroyed. I know that when they put us up in there, it was still in the damaged state. It was still there. That Unfinished, just not only, really, I mean, it was not finished at all, in fact, the, the larger version. So, he did photograph that. That's true, I mean, which is, in some sense, a culmination of his uh, interest in the movement that we see in the sculptures. I mean, some of which I showed, but it is probably the piece in which the whole interest of No, I was thinking that you know, I definitely agree that uh, it's important to uh, locate Lamp Amlinger within the, the milieu uh, through which uh, this uh, entire artistic activity you know, can be uh, whichever. I thought this mic is not working. Yeah, no, um, in the sense that uh, uh, definitely it's important to, uh, it's not only important, it's, it's essential to, in that sense, to locate uh, his work within the milieu through which uh, his language was formed, he departed, etc. But uh, my only problem is that, uh, 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 in a certain sense, I methodologically I feel that, you know, uh, uh, especially in the end of your presentation, that when would you, you, uh, compare the you know something that's spontaneous, you know uh, uh, how they represent the landscape, you know uh, where you know uh, uh, certain sense you uh, in what inadvertently deny you know some kind of a rupture, you know Ramlinger actually uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, you know uh, created or, or generated or. or you know, I'm, I'm not saying that, you know, it's consciously done you know, uh, done that, you know, uh, as a radical artist. I'm, I'm not saying any, any, not in any, any of avant-garde sense, but at the same time, I feel that there is a, there is an element of uh, continuity in him, but at, also there is an equally strong element of a rupture. You know, methodologically, I feel that even though you have marked 
you know, uh, many of them, you know, you know, uh, you know, the difference what you had, you know, initiated within the, the milieu, in the larger milieu, etc. But I, I feel that somehow it is in the end actually somehow, you know, diluted that, uh, you know, uh, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I feel. Uh, no, no. Yeah, I also want to say. Probably we can discuss if this has a point. No, I had a similar point to uh, raise also. Uh, from your presentation, it, it appears that there is a certain continuity. Already before Ramakrishna joined uh, Shantani Gedet, there were these uh, programs around Western art, and there was not that kind of antagonism or polarization between these two things. Uh, uh, so called modern western art or more west as such and the orient you know uh, probably that is true when Tagore uh, was international he had actually moved quite out of the revivalist mold etc but uh, the mainstream mainstay of Shantrigetan still remains to be Nandalalmos somehow as far as art pedagogy is concerned as far as you know now I heard uh, artists like Ram Chandran saying that it was difficult to paint oil medium. So I always understood Ram Kinga Page as having a certain uh, rebellious uh, uh, personality there in that location. You know? I mean, somehow I, I, when I look at uh, Ram Kinga Page's work, uh, it had been always my my view of Ram Kinga Page's work had been always informed by that difference. That maybe coming from his uh, class background, maybe his uh, uh, nature, Bohemian, so-called, you know, I mean, whatever that, however that is. Uh, so Western elements in his art, although in your presentation seems to be kind of a seamless continuation, to my mind is still a marker of his rebellious position. Uh, I mean, I would like you to... I have a completely similar response to one. It, partly, I was, I was withholding this question because it would look like I'm drawing it into my mode, methodological mode or ideological mode of emphasizing rupture. So when Sandor said rupture, I totally, uh, you know, agree with that word. So, I mean, I have been it because it seemed like this is my proposition, whereas your ongoing proposition is a contextual modernism. You know, it is an ongoing, where you create an institutional structure within which people are able to move freely and more freely than we attribute to them. I mean, the attribution that one has had for Shantini Ketan has been much more conservative than how you present it all, in all respects. In all. So, I think that your methodology as well as your ideological import of that is the structure itself was so uh, dynamic and flexible that it allowed several movements. But I think that they equally argue that Ramkinka constantly breaks that. And uh, you know, he breaks that in various ways which you have very, very specifically and uh, elaborated. But I want to link it also to the question that was asked about the political. So you are reading the political so specifically in nationalist terms. After all, from 1943 or from the early 40s, Ram Pinker is more political in many ways than all the others uh, in Chapinigetan and all the others everywhere in, except for Chitra Prashad and then Ram Pinker. So in that sense, the political at that point, already bifurcating. There is the strong communist movement, there is the IBTA, there is, uh, and so on. And Ramkinkan is taking not a determined step towards it, but is creating that decision. So his polit politicality is then gone out of the uh, the given nationalist frame and become uh, aligned with another stream, which goes on. I mean, till 1969, leave alone the election, the whole. Trajectory and, and your own references to Soviet Union and to Spain, to the Spanish pavilion, all of that makes it eminently more political than within the nationalist. No, no, I didn't. I no, I know. I mean, you, you contextualize that, but I'm wondering whether we do need to, like Sotnosh, that we do need to come back to the point that there were continuities in certain genres and mediums. 
I mean, they could have been, but she had uh, uh, two things. One, to start with, I, I am an historian of Shanti. Ah, and yeah. uh, to me, all these figures, I mean, I mean, are people within that frame. So, as you said, that I am not looking at them as individuals, I am looking at them as a part of a group. And uh, there were two things. I, one of my uh, projects, in a way, was to bring Shantanikaran out of the Bengal school. Yeah. Because, which is a kind of nationalism that Shantanikaran didn't subscribe to at his moment. And therefore, there are a number of ruptures even within that. And that was, in a sense, a rupture which nonetheless brought up and which was very significant. Now, the, so, to me, that all these figures are people who are bringing out a series of ruptures of different kinds, to which, I mean, Ram Kikar himself used to But I only felt that when people <coughs> thought about the ruptures, they people completely overlooked the continuities. I am only trying to place both the ruptures and the continuities side by side to demonstrate definitely there were ruptures, but there were also continuities. There were also ground laid in some sense for these ruptures to be possible. I mean, this is what I am trying to say. I am not saying to say that there are no ruptures, that these ruptures are not important, that therefore Nathala, I mean, the Nathala are absolutely similar artists. No, not at all. But what I was only trying to say is that when we think about something, we have to think about it, first of all, as self making a departure from the Bengal school. And that was an important departure. And Nandala plays an important role in that culture. Maybe alongside with Rubinsuma. They were the architects of that costume. Then, of course, Nandala, for a longer period, not that he didn't realize the importance of these models. Think later on in his life when he said, he said, maybe I overdid my nationalism. I probably, if I get a second chance to do it, probably I will overdo this nationalism. Yeah, of course, there is an interview where he says he specifically refers to Picasso and Mathis in that interview. And he says maybe if I have a second chance, probably to be different. So, Nandala himself knew that he was overdoing his nationalism. But he thought that was something that was necessary at that moment to be done. But his aesthetic perceptions and sensibilities were much larger than what the national framework allowed or stood for. And it is something as creative people, people like, you know, Bihari Dhamdi, I mean, Ram Kikar would recognize. And similarly, Nandala too recognized that the outstanding nature of these people. So, we over, when you do this rebelliousness, that we sometimes tend to completely overdraw these differences and completely bury the kind of shared interest that they have, and even sometimes the appreciation that they have for each other's work. Nandala's appreciation for Ram Kingdom completely gets so much that they will not take account of. Like he says that of all my students, these are the two people who are artists in all sense, which are the ideal Ram Kingdom. And uh, the others he says that probably in decorating works, um, his daughter is good, somebody else is good in something else. But none of them are complete artists. And so for making such a statement, definitely he is, and he's doing that in the forms. So definitely he did see there were the kind of thing, there were definitely differences. And the Shantanikaran that Ramachandran speaks about is a more conservative Shantanikaran. Shantanikaran of the 50s was much more conservative than the Shantanikaran of the 40s. He is going there at the end of the 50s, which is a post Tango post Nakalal Shantanikaran, and which was very conservative. And Shantanikaran as an institution which had a great creative potential and passion began to disappear in the 50s. And it is at that point that I mean, Ram, I mean Ramachandran arrives there and he probably faces this. It was much more open before that, it definitely allowed. And whatever reservations. Nandanara might have had on certain issues that was really not to overrule all these things. So definitely we can say it was a much more dynamically open place. And they debated definitely, they debated about these things. And into the 40s, 
almost every day Lakhadar was part of their discussions. So it is only after, somewhere in the mid 40s, a cooling off comes. There is an interesting letter by Nandala where he says during the vacation, he says, we know this around, I can see him sometimes, but he is no more as warm as before. He seems to have withdrawn. Right. And he is very pained, so he writes about this. I mean, I don't know why this is happening. So you can see that it is only somewhere in the mid 40s this kind of thing happens. Till then, they were part of a common kind of thing. And they discussed a lot about it. And, uh, so really, I mean, we need to look at both these things. I'm not saying that one can rub out the other. It doesn't want that. And uh, definitely takes things. And maybe if you're looking at books, they would be poles apart in the extremes. But if you're looking at the way they're thinking about issues and reacting to or the kind of things, ideas they develop, then you see consequences. And some of the ways that they're responding to the immediate environment was something that tied them up. That is what happens in the landscapes. That they are responding to the immediate environment of this thing. And this is something that Nandala brings in and which really links all these artists together besides the other things. And why probably Nandala is so important and maybe one would think that I mean all of these Shantanis and people try to swear by it at all. I mean like Ramachandra and also the one from myself or kind Because when you look at him, in some ways, he was a very liberal person. He might have been a uh, nationalist, but look at what he's trying to do. Which artist is there before him who tries to understand the language of Asian art so well? Who is analyzing it? Who is taking it apart? And trying to show how each one of them works. And without that having happened, I don't think so there would have been possibly you know, the idea of the energy. Now that is a very crucial thing for, I mean, pedagogy, that you have to have access to the language. And without having access to the language, it becomes very difficult. They are closed texts. And really, I mean, I have tried to argue elsewhere that when we talk about the study of Indian art, we talk about people like Kumar Swami, Sardar Pradesh, and all that. I think Nandala should be put beside them as one of those figures who makes Indian art available to us and it is very important and that he makes Indian art available to us, not only Indian art, a lot of Asian art because his interest spreads from Persia to the Far East or Southeast Asia and he is there trying to decode all of these things and which is a very important work and which probably helped these artists even Probably I would think that what allowed brown people to understand Cubism much more fundamentally than it allowed any of the other Indian artists. Now without this methodology being evolved by Nandaka and this work being done, probably this would have been difficult. So if we say that a brown people probably had a much better understanding of Cubism, I mean definitely owe something, I mean possibly owe something to Nandala. So apart from how things look on the surface, I think the kind of work they were trying to do, the kind of issues they were trying to address, that is what brings about all these interviews. Yeah. 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 yeah, very satisfying. Yeah. I think also in, 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 we need to be so wary of, of, of um, making an institutional history also synonymous with the history of the style. So, you know, you're looking at Champion and Capel as the Bengal school, and I think your work is really important in making us see what's happening in Champion and Capel other than the Bengal school style actually uh, developing there. And I think so, you know, looking at Nanda and Moses, and looking at the history of Champion and Capel, and the possibilities made open to the students there as well, including young thinkers, is important for us to know so that uh, it's not just valorizing one individual who rises up as this, this rebellious um, artist that some people got, you know, um, uh, through a context in which certain information, certain, um, well, yeah, information was made available to this guy. So. No, that's what I was very clear about that I'm not talking about in a 
in an avant-garde sense of, you know, right. uh, or a radical artist in that sense. I don't think, uh, at least the way in which I was using the Raktur is not to say that there is something, uh, you know, everything is discontinued uh, what was before. That was not the way in which I was, at least I was referring to the, it's more like you know, the Raktur, more in a Foucauldian sense than Arthur in sense. So, uh, you know, what I was going to say is that there is a, like, your own presentation really began with, uh, you know, the, the multitudinous of the, the, the rambling, the heterogeneous of the rambling there, uh, Visavi, it's not to say that other people hasn't had that a kind of uh, heterogeneity or the multitudinous, but there is a, there is definitely an epistem epistemological break, you know, in terms of, you know, uh, uh, historically considering the, the, the category of uh, modern, modernist artistic language in India. So I'm, I'm, I'm the, the, the rapture here actually more uh, denote to uh, kind of uh, uh, something that, it, it, I'm not even saying that, I'm not even kind of arguing that, you know, ranking as a person, as an artist, you know, uh, self-consciously claimed it or, or made it. I'm saying that there is a, there is a, a definite, a definite epistemological break. You know, it is not to say that there is no connection, no antecedents. You know, it, it completely moved away from something, you know, something original in that sense. So that is the that's the way in which I I try to evoke uh, the question. It's, it's not to say that there is no shared, con shared uh, belief, concerns, uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, linguistic. Uh, commonalities, I think it is important as historians, you know, to also to mark that, 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 that particular kind of an epistemological break or a shift, uh, not necessarily a discontinuity in, in, the, in that sense, you know. So that is the, I yeah. Think, I think that makes it possible for us to yeah. recognize Ram to the last you know, yeah. it, it, it is in some way acknowledging this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that it is not to say that in the context of yeah, I have no problem with your position at all. But okay, what I was trying to say is that I am as I said, confessedly the historian of Shanghai, you know, of that period of the government, sure, sure. of contextualizing what happened there. And in that context, sure. this is how we are here. Suppose I was trying to look at ranking in the context of post, I mean, 50s or 40s world in India, then my way of taking it yeah. would be different. So there maybe, I mean, the Nandala would not figure so heavily, you know, they had even not figure so heavily. These people would not even tackle, probably would not be so heavily. But Ram Kinga would figure much more prominently and importantly with that thing. So there's no problem with that. So, but since I am working within a very specific historical framework of the early 20th century, with its linkages back rather than its linkages forward, where I'm trying to go, that is where I take this decision, where I think both these things are important. In a sense, I mean, uh, beyond this, in a way, I mean, if, for instance, I mean, someone like Subramanian would not have been probably there without the kind of innovations and the kind of thing that Nandala was doing. And that is why I think that Nandala becomes a crucial figure in the they thought about the art language, for instance. Would not have been there without him. Abhinandana didn't bother about it. He was somebody who believed that you are a born artist, you are not, I mean, and all the training you need is six months at the most. And you don't need training to be an artist. But Nandala was taking pedagogy seriously. He thought, no, you have to know the language. We, if you want to go back to India now, it is not sufficient to just look at those things and learn a few symbolisms. But we you have to know how the language operates, what is the linguistic rational behind it. And we thought that if we think of pan Asianism, it has to see how these things are related. And he is very analytical at that point. He was not an articulate man who wrote everything, but if you look at the sketchbooks, if you look at the small statements that he makes, then you can see that this was a man who knew this. And this is an important work in itself, whether it was modern, avant garde, etc., and all the but this is important. And this is a pedagogic framework which is necessary for many things to happen. And that is why Nandala becomes important in this narration of all Shah. I mean, which is, I mean, that's the only reason. It's not, I mean, modernism versus nationalism, these are 
altogether debates actually outside this thing, and I don't really pay much attention to that. I mean, there, there, there are their own importance. I mean, I'm not denying that. But so this, my way of looking at Ramkita is within this perspective, with this interactive thing. There are many things he moves and throws directions of it. And Shantanu itself didn't have this time. I mean, this is something that is important. The Bengal school had this time. Shantanidhan didn't have this time. Who do you call central to it? The way Nandala painted, Rodinwana painted, you know, we have painted all around. There's no particular, I mean, central style. Some of the followers of Shantanidhan, the second generation kind of thing, post 50 artists might have had something like that. Then they valorized Nandala. They make him this, I mean, kind of this guru. And they kind of, they don't understand him at all. In fact, they traditionalize him so much. Miserably kind of make him a kind of, I mean, uh, I mean uh, nationalist, I mean, traditionalist kind of thing. They probably, I mean, destroyed or camouflaged, didn't allow people outside the shop within to see the actual work of Nathala by the kind of things they talked, they write, wrote, they painted, kind of thing. So the post 50s, I think, was a miserable time for Nathala. There was no Rabindranath, no Nathala, were capable of doing that. Nathala himself, to be honest, probably after Tableau became a little conventional. Because he was also so much concerned about preserving. I mean, it does happen. I'm not saying that it doesn't happen. So in the 50s, whatever Nathala did in sense, was in his practice, he wasn't yet concerned. He was trying to open up. But in his pedagogy, in his kind of then there it becomes a little bit stiffer than what it was in the 30s and 40s. And his experimentation kind of comes to an end in some sense. So in a way he contributes to that later shanti I mean that conventionalized, traditionalist kind of mode in which shanti together evolved after the 50s. I think Nathara did contribute by the QC protest in 51, but even then the post, I mean, taboo phase probably Nandala was much more conservative than the, I mean, the years before. But those are things that individuals cannot escape in some ways. And they do and that it's part of the, I mean, history of the institution, it's part of the history of the movement as it happens. Thank you so much, Shubhma, for Thank you.